Hello and welcome to the Roto World Baseball Show. I'm your host Eric Smolski, joined by my co-host Scott Pianowski. Um, starting off with some some somber news, Scott. Um, you know we are. I'm certainly not the the first podcast that's going to talk about the rash of pitching injuries we got over the weekend, and um, sadly, probably won't be the last time we have an injury related discussion uh, during the the this season. Um, but yeah, that's it's been a uh, it was a rough weekend. For baseball fans and fantasy baseball players, uh, with all the injuries that we saw, for sure, um, pitching and injuries goes hand in hand. Just like you know, running backs and injuries are such a huge part of fantasy football. But there was something about the Spencer Strider news, and then followed up with the Shane Bieber news the next day. Bieber had looked terrific through two mm-hmm. starts, one walk, twenty strikeouts. I, I watched almost every pitch of his second start live, and it was so relaxing. He was hitting all of his spots, just dotting yeah. the eye. I was talking about it on Twitter and it looked like he was primed for a huge year. And in a season where so many star pitchers were, are not available yet, you know, we're hoping to see Kershaw and Scherzer and Verlander and maybe DeGrom later this season. We talked about changing of the guard, Spencer Strider. He's the new SP one and Garrett mm-hmm. Cole is a, a first or a second round pick in a lot of leagues. And now these guys are off the board. It sounds like things are really ominous with Strider. I don't know when Cole's going to pitch again. And so it, it seemed like we had a critical mass where everybody's like, okay, enough. All right. We, we got to talk about this. What, what's going on? What do we know? And we're at, this is going to be a big theme of the show today um, yeah. as we try to get some answers here. And, and of course, like this is the fantasy baseball show. We're going to try to give you some advice and I'll, sure. I'll certainly run back some of the advice I had in the preseason, including a lot of my targets who all have ERAs like around seven right now, but <laughs> we'll see how that works out. But it's, um, we live in interesting times because, you know, it's, it's a velocity world. It's an yeah. effort world. Um, guys are pitching for their livelihoods and pitching for their contracts. I don't blame anybody for trying to be as good as they can be, but you just wonder if things have gone a little bit too far and we can, and again, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a major league baseball pitcher. My, my pitching career ended when I was 14 or 15. I never got hurt. I just didn't have any stuff. Yeah. But uh, we'll hopefully try to give people some comfort and maybe some answers today. But a lot, a lot more questions than there are answers. Yeah, there, there are a lot more questions. I don't know that we, you know, I don't know that we have. I know for sure that we don't have the cure all, and I don't know that there is one. I mean, I think you know we are going to get into this discussion a little bit. We will, I, you know, we are going to go through the news and notes of the weekend. We are going to talk about hitters and pitchers who are some of the most picked, you know, added in, in Yahoo formats which of those guys we're interested in. So we are going to, we are going to have a lot of fantasy talk. Um, If you in particular have listened to a few podcasts and you don't, you know, want to hear us talk about the pitching injuries, um, you know, you can fast forward a little bit and get to the fantasy news, but I do think this is all relevant. I think it's relevant to um, what we're going to see happen in the fantasy baseball landscape and how that might potentially be changing both this season and in the future. You know, you and I talked in the offseason about like really not investing high draft picks in pitching um, because of the inherent risk in pitching. Um, you know, so I don't have a lot of shares of, of Strider and Cole. Um, I, I'm not dancing. I'm not victory lapping. I don't want guys to get hurt. And as you said, like, you know, some of the late share guys I had, like, AJ Puck and DL Hall and Bailey Ober, like guys aren't off to great starts. Um, I think in the immediate news, we know Shane Bieber and Yuri Perez, we know they're out for the year. You have to drop them in redraft formats. There is no reason to hold on to them in a redraft format whatsoever. Uh, Spencer Strider, I personally believe is good enough that you should put him on your IL if you have an IL right now. If you don't have an IL, I would keep him on your bench for one more week. I think it sounds super ominous, but he is getting a second opinion. um, And I would expect that you are probably going to cut him in redraft leagues. But I think if you can wait a week um, and see how it plays out, maybe he goes the Kyle Bradish route of, you know, rest and rehab and he's out for two, three months. And, you know, if you were to get Spencer Strider back in mid June, early July, like that would be valuable for your fantasy team. So that that's my fantasy advice on this situation. I don't know if you have a different take when it comes to Strider. Yeah, it's a cosign. You, you'd have to have the waiver wire acquisition of the year to drop Strider. You have to, as, even though we expect, I, I basically agree with everything you said, even though we expect that the other shoe is going to drop soon, you have to wait a little bit longer. Just the payoff is too great if for some reason he did get good news on the second opinion. So even though I don't think this is headed to a good conclusion, you have to wait a little bit longer. 
Yeah. Um, so let's talk about the, the pitching stuff for a second. Um, you know, um, we already came into this year with Shane McClanahan and Robbie Ray and Sandy Alcantara and, you know, a lot of like top tier guys out. Uh, Verlander, Scherzer, Kershaw all delayed. There is, you know, some age factors with those three guys as well. Um, we have now seen since the start of the year, uh, Cole get hurt, Bradish, Senga, um, you know, Yuri Perez, Bieber, Strider now. Uh, it, it feels, you know, Kevin Gossman hurt his shoulder in the spring and has not looked great to start the year. Maybe he'll bounce back. Maybe he won't. We, we don't know. Um, there's a lot of talk online about the pitch clock and the impact of the pitch clock. Um, however, we've also seen, you know, Tommy John surgeries increasing even before the pitch clock was implemented. There's talk about velocity. There's talk about spin rate. Um, I have my thoughts. Uh, I'm curious, you know, do you think that there's a clear issue and a clear fix here? Or is this kind of just a combination of lots of different aspects? I, I certainly, I, I want to start with this. I certainly don't think there's an easy fix. Um, my friend Joe Sheehan, who I reference often on this podcast, he had a, a tweet about his, his back of envelope math was why major league baseball pitchers blow out their elbows in 2024. He had max effort at 65% workload usage effort as amateurs, 18% stuff. We don't know yet. 14% pitch clock slash rest, less recovery at 3%. And so that's, that was how he was kind of back of envelope divvying this up. And again, Joshi and newsletter is highly recommended, not just because he's my friend, but because he's a really smart guy. I just don't know how you tell a pitcher who's trying to be as good as he can be mm -hmm. or maybe just trying to make it in the major leagues as, as anything as a fifth starter, as a spot starter, as a reliever. And he feels like max effort, max velocity, max spin rate is the way for him to be as effective as he can be and get that check. We all know it, it's slowly getting ever so slightly a little bit better, but we know the pay in minor league baseball is horrible and all the money is up front in the majors. You know, it's, yeah. it's not like you can be a career minor league pitcher and, and really make a living at all, which is just shameful the way the money is staggered. But um, Jim Bouton said a million years ago in the great book ball Four, which I'm, I'm rereading, he said that if you offered every pitcher in baseball, a pill that would guarantee 20 wins, which tells you how dated the reference is, but right. it, yeah. a pill would guarantee you 20 wins, but it might take five years off your life. He said every pitcher he knew would take it. And I don't even think that's a statement about pitchers or about baseball players or even about athletes. I think that's a societal thing. I think a lot of people feel, view that way that if I can be more successful, more beautiful, more have more value in my life, I'm willing to pay a price for it later. And, and mm -hmm. so I think a lot of guys are like, well, I'm going to try to max out my ability and hopefully I, I'm not going to, you know, the, the arrow is not going to point to me. I'm not going to be the guy who has his elbow snap or his shoulder go bad or his forearm turn to jelly. And there's been a lot of different theories. Oh, it's the sliders. No, it's, you know, it, again, I hope, I really hope it's not the pitch clock. I love mm -hmm. the pace of baseball since they changed things and I'd hate to go back, but if they can come up with tangible proof that it's, that's a notable problem. Joe had it at 3% in his back of envelope. Yeah. If they can prove that the pitch clock is hurting pitchers at a higher rate, I mean, we'd have to think about changing it. And I would hate to do that because I love the game the way it's flowing now. But, I mean, obviously, yeah. anything we can do to save the pitcher. But let, let me close with this, and I'll throw it back to you. We've never had more intelligence. We've never had more money right. invested. We've never had more stats, more video, more smart people working on this problem. And yet it's a greater problem than it's ever been before. And I think that's just an interesting kind of paradox here. Yeah, and I think some of that is the timing, right? In terms of like how long do how long are we actually giving ourselves to let that data and that money that you're talking about do, do the work? Um, and I, I talked to a bunch of my college teammates. Um, we still have a, a, a text thread. Um, a lot of them, you know, were pitchers in college. Some of them currently work for um, Major League Baseball organizations. Some work you know, for programs that are kind of like driveline, um, but not in terms of like a facility, but in terms of the the equipment used to help with rehab and um, arm strengthening and stuff like that. So a lot of these guys are very much invested in, in this conversation. Um, and the top of the top three things that they said were impacting the pitcher injuries, pitch clock was not mentioned. 
um, they discuss that it obviously, you know, pitchers throwing more pitches when they are fatigued could lead to injury. They did not believe that it was one of the top three things. Um, and what's interesting is that I, and other people have said this too, they, the number one, they obviously mentioned the increase in velocity, right? There is, we do have data that connects velocity to increased injuries. We do know fastball velocity has been up for a long time since prior to the pitch clock. It has been going up and up and up as injuries have gone up. I don't think it's crazy to suggest that the focus on velocity is leading to some of these injuries. Um, another thing that they mentioned um, was this has gotten a little bit of trend on Twitter because somebody is talking about like flat elbow. Um, but what my pitcher friends were mentioning is it's just, where is your, where is your forearm on your release hand at foot plant? When your front foot lands and plants on your release, where is your forearm? Um, the photo that's been going around that's used as an example of this is Nolan Ryan who's uh, the ball is pointed toward the sky. So when Nolan Ryan's front foot lands, the ball is pointed towards the sky, um, kind of like his arm is making like a like almost like a 90 degree angle. Spencer Strider, the ball is pointed out in front of him, um, almost as if his arms are making like a W. Um, and there is a lot of discussion from my friends who are pitchers that that's been proven to cause more strain on your mm -hmm. forearm. That having the ball actually up in the air um, is more of a natural release path from there to the release out in front of you. And so that limits the strain on your forearm. So some of this is mechanical. Now, a lot of guys are being taught not to do that anymore. Um, but like, why was somebody like Bob Gibson or Nolan Ryan able to throw 100 um, and not suffer as many injuries? You could answer luck, genetics. It, it could be those things, right? But there is enough to suggest that the mechanics at foot plant are important enough that maybe we need to go back to saying, oh, okay, what are we gaining from not doing this? What are we gaining from that, you know, W, right? What are we gaining from not having the ball up? Is it spin? Is it increased velocity? Is it worth the potential strain you're putting on our forearm? The biggest thing, that we talked about the number one issue that my friends all believe is leading to this pitch clock uh, or these pitch injuries. And I agree with is what's happening in youth baseball right now. Um, Dr. James Andrews also mentioned, we know that he performs a lot of these Tommy John surgeries that the mile per hour marker where your arm, the tendons in your arm begin to feel more, the most strain is once you start throwing over 80 miles per hour. Most pitchers who are going to pitch in professional baseball are throwing 80 miles an hour by the time they're in high school. A lot of these guys are not throwing 72 mile an hour fastballs as, as freshmen in high school. The issue is that these guys are also pitching year round now. Travel ball has gotten to the point where guys are pitching in their regular high school seasons, they're pitching travel ball seasons, they're pitching year round. So we know they're pitching at velocities that are straining their arm. We know they're doing it now year round because they're trying to get on circuits and get seen by colleges and get seen by scouts and get into the pros and do all this. And so they are putting way more strain on their arms than youth pitchers were putting on their arms 15, 20 years ago. Um, Dr. James Andrews even said that he's doing more surgeries in youth baseball than he has ever been doing before. Um, and I, I think those two things are correlated. One of my friends who works in a major league baseball organization said that they now operate under the assumption that, and these are not his words I'm, I'm summarizing, but they are getting used arms by the time they're drafted to ma to the major leagues that most of these teams know that the the wear and tear on these pitchers' arms is significant by the time they're drafted in the pros. And that's why a lot of professional teams are putting a lot of money into data uh, and gathering information that helps to identify medical red flags in players that are drafted so that you can say, okay, I, I know based on your biometrics 
what your potential issues are. And now I'm going to use my major league baseball, uh, resources to try to fix things in your mechanics or in your, in your regimen, in whatever, to not to have you try to avoid those red flags. Um, and that's where I was saying at the beginning that we have more resources, information than we've never, we've, we've ever had. And maybe in a few years, we'll start to see the benefits of that. Right now, teams are reportedly still kind of like figuring, gathering that information, figuring out how to use that information as much as possible. But teams are aware that a lot of these guys are, a lot of these pitchers are worn down at the time that they draft them. So now they're trying to figure out, okay, what, what particular red flag does each pitcher have when I draft them? Because almost all of them have a medical red flag. Which medical red flag do I feel more um, apt to solve? How can I then prevent that red flag from becoming something that pops up for this pitcher in the future? And I, I personally think that that's the way that baseball teams are going to operate if youth and, and travel baseball continues to be at this level because no other sport, right. With the exception of, you know, football. And we know what football does to like head injuries and stuff like that, but no other sport has this much strain on a part of your body that is uncommon in normal athletics that you're doing over and over and over and over and over and over again. Um, and you know, I know people talk about like, Oh, well, Yuri Perez was babied in his workload, but what was Yuri Perez's workload when he was 14, when he was 15? We don't, we don't know those things, right? We don't know how many innings he pitched in the equivalent of a season at 15 years old. You've got some kids in high school who are playing 50 game high school seasons and then playing travel ball all around it. And some of those kids are playing like 110, 120 games in a season at 14 years old at 13 years old, at 15 years old, and they're doing it over and over and over again, if those kids are pitchers, like, yeah, you might say, oh, well, you know, in youth ball, you can't pitch, you know, more than 120 innings in a game, and then you can't pitch the next day. Well, sure, but that kid is pitching 100 innings on the weekend for his travel team, and then he's pitching another 100 innings during the week for his high school team, um, and then he's throwing bullpens in between that. It, it is a lot of pitches when you're doing that over the course of a full year. And and so I that makes me less optimistic that we're going to see a, a real resolution um, in the near time. One of the ironies to the state they're in right now is that Major League Baseball, and you, and you talked about this a little bit with Perez, is we're at a time where they've moved away from the overwork, uh, the overuse that pitchers routinely, you know, everybody saw what happened to Kerry Wood and Mark Pryor when they were – stars with the Cubs early in their careers and, and they got over overworked and overtaxed and their careers flamed out. Uh, Wood did have a second act as a closer, which was really enjoyable prior and maybe prior was just going to get hurt anyway. I mean, I, but I mean, teams, there would be an outcry. We see pitchers routinely pulled before they can get wins. We see pitchers mm -hmm. pulled with no hitters or, you know, with big strikeout numbers where in the past it'd be like, Oh, just go for it. You know, this is a career defining moment. And now it's like, no, 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 we get to try to save the pitcher. Let me ask you this. So, you know, obviously a fantasy baseball show. There's there's two things I think we're I'm always trying to do anyway. I think most people are trying to do with pitching. One is I'm trying to, and maybe this is a folly, but with the first half of my drafts, I'm like, well, can I take a safe pitcher? Can I take somebody who's yeah. proven to be durable? Or maybe somebody who doesn't throw with the high velocity. And no, granted, just because somebody throws in the low 90s, maybe they're maxing out to get to 93. I mean, that's kind of right. a hard thing for me to quantify. I don't have the sophistication maybe to understand that on a level that somebody else, maybe Nick Pollock would or somebody like that, or, Eno Saris. But, um, and of course, you know, you pitched in, in college. So I, I certainly defer to your expertise on this as well. But so I was thinking maybe the Logan Webbs or maybe the, the George Kirby's who does get into the mid nineties, maybe the Chris Bassett's middle rounds. And, and ironically enough, Webb and, and Bassett have a Tommy John in their history. If you look back a decade or so, I was thinking maybe some of those guys might be safer. Now, all of them are pitching poorly right now. We're just talking about a couple of starts. I don't really care about that. I mean, mm -hmm. Webb didn't have it against the Dodgers. That's going to be a problem for a lot of pitchers this year. But so I, I'm trying to think in the first half, 
people who haven't drafted yet or people who are called cultivating trades. Is there anything, is a safe pitcher exists? Can we look at anybody and say, oh yeah, yeah, I feel pretty good. He'll make 28 or 30 starts. And interestingly enough, the giants did sign Webb. It was a reasonable extension, but they did sign mm-hmm. him, I think to a five-year extension. We talked about the paradigm shift. Blake yeah. Snell off his second Cy Young could only get a short contract. Montgomery got a short contract. So I'm wondering, is it and I is the idea of safety, does that exist or is that just a folly? And the other thing I'll say, and everybody's trying to do this, is we're all trying to find inexpensive pitching that has high right. upside. You were pounding the table to your credit for Jared Jones before the season through two starts. He looks like a screaming right answer. The Red Sox staff, I know they're on the road against some really bad offenses, but Andrew Bailey is a pitching coach I'm excited about. And just about everybody in the staff looks looks either good or great right now. I have a lot of Cutter Crawford. I have less of some of the other guys, but I, almost anybody in the staff I'm interested in. I think it may be because Bailey is on to some good things now. For all I know, yeah. you know, any of those guys could get hurt tomorrow. But so talk to me about is, is safety a myth or is there is there such thing as even a pitcher who might be more safer than the other guy? And uh, is there anything other than the stuff we always talk about, about how do we find the next Jared Jones? So first, I'll say I, I was a catcher in college. I don't want to. Um, okay, I, I, I did work. I did work a lot with the, with the pitchers. Um, I, you know, I believe all the great catch, managers. I believe are I will say catchers, I believe you know? catchers yeah. know as much about or the catcher should be the smartest less. guy in the team. I mean, I, I've sure, always yeah. believed that. We know just a little bit less about pitching than pitchers. Sometimes mm-hmm. maybe no, we know more, but you know, you don't want to upset the pitchers. Um, I I think yes, there is such the thing as a safer pitcher, and I think we don't know who that is because i i do think that like as we were talking about a little bit earlier to understand who a safer pitcher is i think we need to understand a lot more about the biometrics of that pitcher and his release and um you know what his mechanics and whatever than i think we currently know now you could do detailed study on the biomechanics of the top pitchers you know study there we could if they were all at driveline or tread or whatever you could get the information on like where what happens to their body on release etc all these sort of things um and so i do believe that there are some elements that make somebody appear to be safer than somebody else i don't think it's just velocity that's that's a component of it but i don't think it's just velocity i don't think it's just previous injury history but that is a component of it i don't think it's just previous workload but that is a component of it so sure you could just stay away from all high risk pitchers but i i don't know that we can correctly identify who actually is high risk or not um you know i think you could avoid pitchers who have non-surgically repaired injuries in the past um it was reported you know shane bieber had a forearm issue last year um obviously did not have surgery in the off season to correct it. And that could have, we don't know for sure, but it could have contributed to this injury. Now, um, Max Fried pitched through a forearm injury or had a forearm injury last year appeared to be behind him. He hasn't looked himself in the first two starts. Maybe that's something, you know, uh, I I just think you would, you'd probably find a reason to avoid 80% of the pitchers. If you were doing that, so, you know, if you want to f- if you want to draft only guys who don't throw hard with great and who have great mechanics and who haven't had a lot of injuries in the past, like maybe you could field a roster like that. I do- I don't know who's on it. Um, you'd be getting a lot of like Kyle Hendricks, um, and and maybe you can put together a team like that. I I just. I think that that's not really the solution. Um, I think it's interesting. The Red Sox will be interesting at the end of this season because, as you mentioned, they are set to – they're currently on pace to set a record for the fewest amount of four-seam fastballs thrown. If we know that velocity impacts injuries um, and then you have a team that actively doesn't throw the fastball as much and if they wind up healthier than most other pitching staffs at the end of the season, like maybe that's – that warrants a study we had thought hey like breaking balls are bad for your your elbow and maybe when you're 11 and you don't really know how to throw it possibly but maybe cutters like gyro sliders like that as primary fastballs like maybe there's something to that i we don't we don't know for sure um it'll be interesting to see how it all plays out 
right now we are, I think we're caught in the bummer stage. I do think there will be a little bit of light. It might take a couple of years until we get the information for, for that to be light. You mentioned Kyle Hendricks. He was such a great um, fantasy pitcher all through his 20s. And he led the National League in, in strikeout walk ratio as recently as, as 2020, the pandemic season. But the problem with guys like Hendricks who are thrown on the lower end of velocity, who are surviving with great control, great placement, not a lot of strikeouts, not a lot of walks, is that once they lose a little bit, once it goes a little bit south of these guys, yeah. it's like, look out below. You know, he had, Hendricks in the pandemic season, 2.88. ERA, he had eight strikeouts for every walk. That's fantastic. And then the next year, his ERA is 4.77. The year after that's 4.80. Um, yeah, and ironically, he missed some time in 2022 as well. I, I, I do like pitchers like that. And, you know, Bassett's in his 30s. I know that when I draft Chris Bassett, in part because I like, you know, he's, he's a boring player. He's one of those, uh, you know, DVR, we call those guys oatmeal players. I call them mm -hmm. Abanias, all stars, boring value vets, whatever. I'm just asking Chris Bassett to go out and you win 12 to 14 games, throw 175 good innings, get some strikeouts through volume. But I know that he's in his mid thirties with major league stuff, but not nothing eye popping. And that when it goes bad for Chris Bassett, some year he's going to have an ERA over five. That's just right. the way his career is going to end. And I, Brand, he said about a lot of pitchers, but when the control guys lose a little bit, they start to get hammered. Yeah, and he has a 771 ERA through two starts. Um, mm -hmm. I have avoided Bassett just because I think the other shoe is going to drop at some point. Um, but who knows? Maybe not this year. Um, we are going to transition now into actually talking some positive news. Um, mm -hmm. Positive. Well, that's, we're going to talk about some news and notes. Some of them is positive. Some of them are not. Uh, but before we do that, now you need to get your weekdays started with Bet the Edge. Join Jay Croucher and Drew Dinsick as they break down MLB, NFL. NFL Draft, the NBA, and much more. New episodes drop at 6 a.m. Eastern on the NBC Sports YouTube channel, and you can find that in podcast form wherever you download and subscribe. So whether you're looking to get involved in the awards markets or player props, check out Jay and Drew for more insight. That is weekdays with Bet the Edge. Um, so we're, we're going to talk about some pickups. Before we do, I want to run through some real quick uh, news and notes from the weekend um, besides just the pitching injuries, uh, we do have some good news on pitchers who are either returning or close to returning. Um, I'm going to tell you the names and you can just tell me in general, if you're interested in, in these arms, um, we already know Sonny Gray, Nick Lodolo and Aaron Ashby are all coming back this week. Sonny Gray will pitch today. Nick Lodolo is set to pitch, uh, sorry, Aaron Ashby will also pitch today, um, for the Brewers. Um, against the Reds, and Nick Lodolo is set to come back on Wednesday against the White Sox. Uh, do you have any level of interest in any of these three guys? I mean, great, great for sure. Who's obviously rostered anywhere, and you know, you either have him or you don't. I expect I, I trust the Cardinals did their diligence when they signed him, and I, I expect him to be good this year. Lodolo and Ashby. I know this sounds very convenient, and maybe you can't execute it in your league. They're like high on the watch list guys or, or play, players that I would pick up and not use right away just because I think they have plausible upside. They've shown the ability to miss bats and you know, the ability to get strikeouts. Braxton Garrett is actually, because the Marlins, you never know how, how um, honest teams mm -hmm. are with injuries. There's no incentive to tell everybody the truth. A, a player has no incentive to tell us how hurt he really is, but because they soft pedaled the Braxton Garrett news so much, and again, he's one of those control, you know, volume, but strikeouts by volume control guys. I found him very watchable last year. If the Marlins are telling us the truth, and granted, not, not, almost nothing has gone right for that team. They finally got their first win. I think it was on Sunday with Max Meyer pitching really well, and they've had a ton of pitcher injuries. I have a lot of Garrett stashed on some IL spots in deeper leagues. So I'm curious to see what he does. Bueller was dominant in his second rehab start. He didn't pitch so mm -hmm. well in his first rehab start. And it, because they've always been optimistic about him coming back so early, they have no reason because the Dodgers already have one foot in the playoffs. I can't imagine they would let Bueller pitch this early if they weren't pretty confident about his health. So mm -hmm. I'm excited. I don't, I don't have a ton of Bueller. I have a couple of shares somewhere, but I'm excited to watch him pitch in the Dodgers. Their, their whole staff is like that, right? It's a bunch of wait for it guys, but yeah. Um, everybody is gray and Bueller. You don't need my help on, but Ashby and Lodolo, I, I do the type of guys. I would not be surprised at all if they had like an eight or nine strikeout game coming fairly soon. Yeah. I have gray slightly above Bueller. I would 
I would prefer to have Gray over Bueller, but I think they both deserve to be rostered in all leagues, and they are for the most part. Um, and they, they both appeared. I mean, Gray we know is coming back. Bueller, I think they said one more minor league start. Lodolo and Ashby are pitchers I have been interested in in the past. Um, I Ashby didn't look great in the spring, missed all of last year. Um, so for him, like I'm not even stashing or adding. I will watch and see how he looks. Um, I'm ready to kind of pounce on that if he looks pretty strong. Lodolo, I think, is good enough to warrant a bench stash in, in most formats. Um, again, depending on how ravaged you were with injuries, you certainly don't have to add him. Um, I really do like Edward Cabrera, who I think is set to make one more start for the Marlins. Um, he had showed much better command in spring training. That was a huge thing for him was, was command. Um, and I think if he shows improved command in the, in the regular season, that would be um, certainly interesting for him. Him and Braxton Garrett, I think both have one more start in the minor leagues. Um, and then Michael Lorenzen is going to get one more start in the minors before he joins the Rangers rotation. Um, I believe he's going to push out Cody Bradford. I know people are like, oh, Cody Bradford's pitched so well the start of this year. Um, Bradford's arsenal, his whole arsenal grades out below average. Um, I, I He's fine. I, I don't necessarily think this is somebody you need to be chasing. Um, if you're in a league and you want to add Cody Bradford this week because he faces the Angels, I mean, sorry, the Angels, the Athletics, uh, by all means, do, do that. Um, though we did just see the Athletics tag Jack Flaherty for six runs this weekend. Um, but I, I think Lorenzen is a good deep league value. Um, he was solid, fine last year um, in his second year as a starter. I don't think he's going to miss a lot of bats, but I think his ratios should be fine in a, in a pitcher's park on a really good team. Um, some let, negative. Let, let me ask you really quickly. Uh, Nathan Avaldi kind of speaks for himself, but is there anybody else in that Texas staff we haven't mentioned that you like? I, it's, I feel like every week I look at like Dane Dunning and Andrew Heaney and I'm like, do I really have the stomach for that? Yeah. And then the Dunning goes out and it seems like he has a lot of those quality starts, which are a currency these days. But I, I feel like the moment I start him, he's going to allow seven runs. How do you feel about John Gray has been a tease his entire career? I, is there anybody yeah. there that interests you? I think John Gray and Dane Dunning in deeper formats are interesting depending on the matchup. Um, you know, Dunning has struck out 14 in 13 innings this mm -hmm. year, and that is different for him. So it's worth looking into. Um, he just pitched yesterday, so I haven't had a chance to really dive in on that start. But, you know, um, he faced Tampa Bay and Houston, and I know Houston doesn't really look great to start the year, but Seven strikeouts and over six innings in both of those starts, I think, warrants our attention. Um, I don't know how long it will keep up. And John Gray is the same. Like, he flashes um, and then, you know, kind of falls off. I think Texas knows that three-fifths of their rotation is coming back in July, or they're hoping, with uh, DeGrom and Scherzer and Tyler Malley. And so I think that they're just content to try to be in contention by the time their rotation gets healthy rather than, like, People are like, why don't they spend on Jordan Montgomery? Well, I don't I don't think they wanted to do that. Remember that like Texas had a real lull last year where everybody thought they were going to win the AL West and they kind of fell apart a little bit. And then there was a question of like whether Texas would make the playoffs like they really struggled. Um, and then they got into the playoffs and obviously we know went on on a heater and won the World Series. And so I think a team like that operates under the assumption of it doesn't matter how good we are in april and may are are we competitive are we setting ourselves up to be able to make the postseason because if we make the postseason it's a little bit of that like ncaa tournament philosophy mm -hmm. but it's like if we make the tournament and are at full strength come the playoffs then that's what matters the most um and so i i think texas is operating under that assumption yeah, it's um, funny how they have a lot of those wait for it guys like the dodgers do they just don't have the stand-ins like yes. the Dodgers have that are so great right now. And I just want to close with John Gray. He's one of those pitchers that if I knew he was pitching and I went out and went out to dinner, played poker or something, missed baseball that night, you could text me and tell me any pitching line for John Gray. I'd believe it. You tell me through a no hitter. You tell me he struck out 15 guys. I'd believe it. you could tell me he allowed like five home runs and hit three batters. I'd believe it. I just, I feel like anything's in play when he's on the mound. For sure. Um, sadly, we know what happens usually with, with Luis Robert in his history. Um, he is an injury prone player. He suffered an abduct, an adductor strain. Um, so a hip, a hip strain. Um, it's the same injury that cost him like three months, um, in years prior. 
He says it's not as severe. The team has given a timeline of six to eight weeks. So I think as of right now, we'll see how that plays out. Again, it might be closer to you know 10 to 12 weeks. We've always talked about that. The White Sox probably are not going to be competitive. So do they want to rush him back before he's fully healthy? I still think you hold Luis Robert, even if you don't have an IL spot, um, because if it winds up being closer to six to eight weeks, he's going to be valuable for you when he's back. Um, I don't really love any of the options for the White Sox outside of deeper formats. Um, I did pick up Gavin Sheets in a few places because he um, was starting with the Eli Jimenez injury a few weeks ago and now has a little extra breathing room, but he's hit third or fourth in every game um, in the last week. And so a guy who has first base outfield eligibility, who's hitting in the middle of a lineup, is valuable in deeper formats. Um, he looked pretty good in the spring. Maybe he gets it going. He's just 27 years old. Maybe not. Um, and then they called up Robbie Grossman from AAA, and he has led off the last two games. And so, again, Robbie Grossman is almost 35 years old. He hasn't been great outside of that one year. He went 2020. But again, in deeper formats, AL only type formats, he's a leadoff hitter. He's probably going to play pretty regularly while uh, Robert is sidelined. I think you could, you know, use that. I think the big takeaway here is like if you have a pitcher facing the White Sox who were already bad and don't have Eloy Jimenez and Luis Robert, I, I think you want to start 90% of those pitchers. Yeah, you mentioned Nick Lodolo earlier. He gets the White Sox in the middle of the week. So that maybe that breaks the tie for you. Um, Mackenzie Allen and, and Bybee are going to pitch in the Cleveland series. The AL Central is such a soft, we say it all the time, it's such a pillow landing for these pitchers and we want to yeah. aggressively attack it. The White Sox might have the worst lineup in baseball right now. I think they might. They might. Um, I'm, not, I'm, at, you know, I, I'm going to rephrase they, that. They do. No, they do. They do. I they mean, do. at least Colorado gets half their games at at sure. sea, you know, at the, you know, the, the the high elevation and, you know, you can feel good about playing a handful of their hitters, even though I don't yeah. like that team overall. And then when they go on the road, they pay a tax for that. But um, anytime you see the White Sox lined up, and I will, I will look every week to try to take advantage of that to try to. Yeah, as, yes, as you should. Um, sad for us, um, and really sad for baseball fans. Uh, it seems like Trevor Story, his his shoulder injury is serious. Um, his he was off to a solid start this year. Defensively, he was off to a tremendous start. The Red Sox have gotten off to a hot start. I understand they played poor competition um even though actually they did play the mariners and i don't know if we've fully accepted that the mariners lineup is bad yet or not um but the red sox look good on a west coast road trip you know 11 games out west it's tough they they did well story said over the weekend that he hopes to come back and play in 2024 anytime a player says that um it means that there's a really strong likelihood that's not going to happen um also it means that in a best case scenario you might be looking at like in August return, the Red Sox um, have, are doing further testing on him today, Monday. So we have no set timeline yet. I think he's, it's safe to assume you should assume he's not going to be back this year. Um, obviously if you have IL spots, you don't have to drop him until they give the timeline for sure. Um, Vaughn Grissom is, is still, you know, set for his mid April, late April return. Maybe the Red Sox just slide him to shortstop. He has been a poor defensive shortstop, and the team views him as a second baseman long-term, so maybe they want to keep him at second. That could mean Pablo Reyes starts regularly at shortstop. It could mean David Hamilton gets starts at shortstop. He came back. He came up yesterday, um, hit a home run. He did have 17 home runs and 57 steals in AAA last year, so there's some potential there. Maybe the Red Sox move Sedan Rafaela back to shortstop for this year, but... He's a gold glove caliber center fielder. Do you really want to impact his future defensive home? Um, do you think anybody that we are not currently rostering for from the Red Sox becomes rosterable in the wake of the Trevor Story injury? Yeah, deeper leagues, I could tell my story myself a story about Grissom or or Hamilton. You mentioned the defensive deficiencies with Grissom. Hamilton, at least you can look at the possible category juice. I know he didn't hit in this cup of coffee last year. And even in the minors, he didn't have the greatest slash profile, but the power is going to play a little bit. He's going to run. And it's obviously never been a better time for stolen bases. He did hit the ground running with a good game on Sunday. He did slot ninth in that lineup also. 
I'm just sad for, we were so excited about this Boston staff and I still am, but a big part of that was the defense that they had fixed the defense up the middle. They'd fixed the outfield defense yeah. and story as much as we talk about him for fantasy because of his power and because of his speed, he's a plus defender and it's just nice to see him playing baseball again and, and to see that wash out. And, and this is also just a reminder that for all the talk of pitchers getting hurt, there's been a lot of offensive guys. You have at least Roberts, a star and, and Trevor story at his best is an all-star caliber player. And so those yeah. guys get hurt too. But um, I, it also, if you need, if you had something you were encouraged to pick up, there's somebody, I don't think you would have to wait a lot around for story. I mean, you'd, you'd like him to come back. I don't think he's going to come back this year. And, and if it does, there's no guarantee he'll be productive. Unlike Strider, where I feel like he's a forced hold. Mm -hmm. If you see something you want right now, you have my permission to cut story. Yeah, I, and I cut him in some 12-team NFPC leagues where I, I just didn't have an IL spot. Um, now, instead of cutting, we're going to talk about adding. Um, and so we're going to try to get through as many of these guys as quickly as possible. I'm going to give some names. Scott and I will quickly say what our level of interest is in these players. Um, a lot of these guys are, we're going to start with hitters who were the most added hitters um, in Yahoo leagues over the weekend. Uh, the most added hitter in Yahoo leagues um, was Brendan Donovan, um, in part because his shoulder checked out fine. He's hitting leadoff for the Cardinals. Um, and you know, he's got multi-position eligibility. This is a guy hitting 313 at the start of the year. He had 11 home runs and 95 games last year before getting hurt. So there's some power growth. Um, how interested are you in Brendan Donovan? I mean, I had a lot of shares of him last year and it didn't work out well in part because of the injuries. He's always going to be more valuable in real life. He's an OBP guy and he's a multiple position guy. Even with a little bit of a power spike last year, he's not really a category juice player. He's not going to run that much. The key for him is can he keep an everyday spot and is he going to be batting leadoff? I don't know how great this Cardinals lineup is. Maybe the the back nine of Goldschmidt and Arenado is going to bite them. Remember, they finished last last year, and I, I'm not sure they're going to be great this year. But um, I actually like the second name that you have here listed more than Donovan. Uh, and that's Bryce Terang. And Bryce Terang is somebody who um, – there was some talk about him getting sent down in the spring. The Garrett Mitchell injury may have allowed him to have a little bit more leeway because Sal Frelick had to move back to the outfield. Uh, but Bryce Terang is on here and is being added because of the speed. Um, he has seven steals through his first eight games. He is hitting 360. Yes, that does come with a 474 Babib. Um, but, you know, he hit uh, 286 um, at AAA in 2022, um, you know, 298 in a brief stay at AAA uh, last year, didn't hit the majors, um, but, you know, that average, that speed, you're not going to get power, but, and he hits at the bottom of the lineup, but that speed, it, it could be a real difference maker. It may sit against some lefties too, a plus defender, which marks his place in the lineup. And here's the thing with Terrain, when you're going to accept a player who, we know comes with some baggage. He's not proven, doesn't have a lot of average upside, could be an average detriment. You have to say to yourself, is this somebody who could run like crazy, mm -hmm. could steal bases in clumps, could have a green light? And who knows? Because he doesn't have bad plate discipline. If he just becomes a little bit, we, we talked about Anthony Volpe, and I'm not trying to say Terang is Anthony Volpe, but he doesn't need to get that much better where you could tell right. yourself a story that Terrain could be batting first or second in the second half of the year, which is a total game changer. We saw that with CJ Abrams last year, mm -hmm. seventh, eighth, ninth, early part of the season. By the end of the year, he's batting leadoff, getting that extra at bat, getting the green light, and he ends up with you know, 47 stolen bases and 52 attempts or something like that. And then I feel like Abrams can steal as many bases as he wants as long as he gets healthy. He's dinged up right now. So Terang, your, his floor, I think, is going to be 30 to 35 steals. And if things pop for him, I can see him maybe getting 10 or 15 more and maybe he hits for a reasonable average. Yeah, he's still uh, – he's only rostered in – uh, sorry, in 63% of Yahoo leagues. So he has gone over that, like, 50% mm -hmm. threshold. Right. But he, he should be added in more leagues if you are in one of those leagues. He's not rostered. Um, I'll jump to his teammate just because we're here. It's Oliver Dunn. He was not one of the most added, but he's somebody who really popped for us with the weekend performance. Um, Oliver Dunn has started regularly um, for the White Sox, oh, sorry, the Brewers over the last five games. He actually hit leadoff last game. Um, he's seven for 22 on the year with one home run, three runs, four RBIs, and two stolen bases in seven games. This is a guy who was in the Phillies organization last year. In double A, 
hit 271 with 21 home runs and 16 steals. He was great in the AFL. Um, I blurbed about him when we were doing AFL stuff over on Roto World, and I said if he ever is on a team where he's not blocked, because again, as a second baseman, third baseman on the Phillies, he had no path to playing time. And I said if he's ever on a team where he's not blocked, he could be interesting. Um, he is not blocked in Milwaukee, and so far he has proven to be interesting. Um, there is a little bit of swing and miss in his game. 27% strikeout rate in double A last year means that could catch up with him. But if you're in deeper formats, he's only 3% rostered on Yahoo. Um, I like a guy who hits left-handed, so he will play almost every game against righties, and he's leading off in a good hitter's park. I think he's worth a gamble. I don't know how long he's going to be on your roster. We'll see how long he keeps it up, but I think he's worth a, a spot on your roster in deeper formats. Cosine. I can't believe you, you left. It's a very comprehensive done breakdown. Remember the huge walk rate, which yes. he had all through the minors, which parks him at the top of that lineup. So yeah. I, other than that, I'd just be rehashing everything you said, which I'm going to give a check mark to. Yeah, OBP and uh, OPS formats. He, he's great. Um, the third most added player. In Yahoo Leagues, a hitter, sorry, was Heston Kierstead. Um, he is on the Norfolk Tides, uh, the major league baseball team that plays AAA for the Orioles. The Orioles uh, of know, everybody. How, how did this happen? We know they went crazy, um, you know, with that 26 run outing in the off in the a week over the weekend. Here's my thoughts on Heston Kierstead, though. I wouldn't. I, first of all, if you have space on your team, you can add him to your bench. Do it. He's a very talented player. He'll be up eventually this year. I don't see the Orioles going to him before they go They go to Colton Kowser. Mm -hmm. Colton Kowser hit better than Kerstad in spring. He hit over 360 with six home runs. He earned the spot on the, the Orioles. Um, Colton Kowser is also a former top prospect. He was a top 30 prospect on almost all lists. He's just 24 years old. He was the fifth overall pick in 2021. It's not like he's just some guy who's getting a shot over Heston Kierstead. He is a legitimate prospect. If the Orioles are going to move on from Austin Hayes, who's hitting 077 to start the year, I think they're going to give Colton Kowser a shot first before they promote Heston Kierstead and give Heston Kierstead a chance. So I don't think it's wrong to stash Heston Kierstead, but I think... I would much rather be picking up Colton Kowser right now because I think he's also a prospect of some merit. I think he has a more immediate path to playing time. He's only rostered in 7% of Yahoo leagues. Um, I think if you have a bench stash spot, I, I think it has to be Colton, Colton Kowser. Totally agree. That shocked me um, that his tag was that low. I, when you were talking because I didn't see it listed in the rundown, what it, what it was. I thought, oh, it's probably like 15 or 20% on Kowser. And as you said, it's just seven. He has 7%. He has the pedigree. It's just comical that all these I know. players, the, the, I know. the Orioles, Joe Posnanski had a great piece on it today about how the Orioles have had early picks in drafts where there was a player like Ad, Ad, Adley Rutschman available and like the Tigers keep getting drafts where, and who knows, maybe Casey Mize will become something and maybe Torkelson who was, better last year will eventually become a really good player, but they've had drafts where it wasn't really clear who the number one pick was. And you were just taking you know, the, the Joe Smith's of, you know, the NBA number one overall pick one year. Cause that was just the best that was there that year. There wasn't a Rutschman available, but the Orioles, man, they've just hit on so many guys. When do you think this, I know this doesn't fit the theme. And we're always going to go over on time. Cause I just can't be concise as much as I need to, but I got to ask you this because holidays off to such a huge start. When do mm -hmm. you think Jackson holiday is on the Orioles? I think soon. Um, I think before May, before May first mm. would be my guess. I take that. I really, I, I really holiday. don't. I really don't believe he was sent down for roster manipulation or playing time manipulation. I know some people do. I believe Eno Saris said that it would require him to be kept um, until uh, May twenty fifth in order for that to be roster manipulation. Look, he struck out thirty two percent of the time in spring training. That's not unheard of but also he's 20 years old so if he's 20 years old he hits great in spring but he strikes out 32 percent of the time it's not crazy to say look you're super close like you could probably do this but we don't need you to do this right now so if we can just get this one thing in check start the year off good strong right we we talk a lot on the show that like the mental component of baseball i think gets overlooked if you have a top prospect like holiday 
who had a little bit of a strikeout issue in spring training while not facing just MLB caliber pitching. There were a lot of like double A, triple A pitchers in there. If he comes up and starts the year like Lindor started the year, right? Where he was like one for 30 something. A guy like Lindor has been doing this forever. And he's got a sense of like, I'm going to figure it out. It's fine. Maybe Holiday has that too. But what if he doesn't? What if he starts the year one for 30 and is like, ah, damn it. Like, I really thought, like, I thought it was this was going to start better. And then if he starts pressing and then he starts making bad swing decisions, why not send him to AAA, a, a level that he only had 18 games at last year? Let him crush. Let him show that he has better feel for the strike zone. Let him make consistent contact. Let him do that for a few weeks or a month. Let him come up feeling like he's king of the world and just, you know, go through it. Um, You're who's already, you know like already married, by the way. I didn't, actually. 20 years old, already married. So maybe he was trying to con the Orioles into thinking he was already 24 or something like that. But maybe. yeah, I like that. I like that idea that he's up before May 1st. And, and look, I'm being totally selfish. The or it's there's nothing wrong for for him spending a little bit more time in AAA. Um, it's I don't think it's going to be long either. So um, I, I would take as a somebody who usually doesn't draft that type of player in a redraft, but I do have some holiday. Mm -hmm. I would take I would settle for before May first. I would take that. Yeah, uh, we're going to lump these these next hitter groups into into two separate groups. The first are, are teammates, and they both share the uh, same first name. Um, but we have uh, Jose Siri and Jose Caballero who are on the Tampa Bay Rays. Um, they are both under 40% uh, rostered, and they're both on here because of speed. Um, Jose Siri Steady wants to steal 30 bases this year. He has three stolen bases over the last four games. Jose Caballero has four stolen bases over the last eight games. Um, Siri is showing a little bit better plate discipline, but his batting average will never be a huge asset, but he has some power. Um, if he does steal a lot, he hit 25 home runs last year, so if he steals more this year you could be looking at an easy 2020 guy but he might hit 220 also um jose caballero is uh eight for 27 over his first eight games he doesn't really have any competition at shortstop and he has four steals um i like getting both of these guys if you need steals their defense is going to keep them in the lineup almost all the time for tampa um uh, caballero is going to have a better batting average and speed series going to have more power and speed um, it just depends on on your build. Yeah, they're both endorsed by me. I, I prefer Siri a little bit more because a deeper major league resume. And as you said, the 25 homers last year, even with that swing in anything approach. But um, And also they're both playing every day. You never can be sure of that in Tampa Bay where it feels like 162 games, 162 lineup cards. But right now, both of them are free from a platoon. Yeah, and that and that's great. We want to get those at bats right now. Um, the last three hitters I will lump together because they're all guys you would take in like a corner infield spot. So I'm curious which of these three guys jumps out more to you. Uh, we have Michael Bush for the Cubs, who over his last four games is six for 16 with a home run, three runs, and five RBIs playing every day for Chicago. Gio Urshela, who was not starting at the beginning of the year for the Tigers and then has seemed to climb back into a near full-time role, is six for 17 with one run scored and three RBIs over the last four games. And then Brett Beatty for the Mets um, is six for 19 with two RBIs and two runs scored over the last five games. Um, if you were choosing a corner infield position player for out of that group, who would you be siding with? Beatty for the pedigree. And and then I would go Bush or Shell is just kind of the middle of his career guy. I also wonder if Shell might be a part-time player where AJ Hinch is, is kind of having that Tampa Bay mentality with the lineup card but uh, Beatty's upside and ceiling certainly seems the, the highest to me um I I would put Beatty second um I would go with Michael Bush first um I just like the power that I'm going to get from Michael Bush I don't think I'm going to get power um from Beatty and I think the Cubs lineup is a better lineup um, I'd rather have a player in that lineup um and I know there are swing and miss issues um I think he's going to get a little bit of a of run though yeah, even though bush has a decent walk rate all the rest of his plate discipline metrics right now are really bad it just makes mm -hmm. me a little bit nervous yeah. but um he's perfectly reasonable I, I think we both agree that urshela was the distant third guy in that list yeah and i would say these are all guys where you pick them up and see where it goes but they don't they wouldn't have to feel locked into your roster even Beatty and bush who have prospect pedigree 
if they struggle in the next few weeks, you can you can find somebody else. Um, Scott and I are going to run through a couple pitchers to add. Um, before we do that, just a reminder that you can find all episodes of the Roto World Baseball Show and all your other favorite NBC sports shows on Amazon Music. So just head to Amazon.com slash NBC Sports. Um, Scott, the number one pitching ad in Yahoo formats was Reed Detmers, who looked really good against the Red Sox so far this season. Through two starts, um, he's pitched 11 innings. He has allowed just two earned runs on five hits, struck out 19, and walked four. Um, Lance Brozdowski wrote on Twitter about um, Detmers's fastball, which uh, has a lot more um, vertical movement, and is throwing it. he's throwing it up in the zone a lot. This is the guy who has perennially been like a, is he going to break out guy? Um, he's still only 24 years old. Uh, he is now now just rostered in 56% of Yahoo leagues, and that's with a 24% increase in the last day. So this is a guy who was almost 30% rostered just 24 hours ago. Do you think we're going to get a breakout? You have to chase it. <laughs> 19 strikeouts and four walks in 11 innings. And it's a guy who had a little bit of pedigree. He's got a no-hitter on his resume. Um, decent place to pitch. Yeah, I, I wish I had some. Um, I, I had plenty of Detmers the last couple of years. I, I thought maybe he was coming into his own in 2022, and he took a step back last year. And we talked even the strikeout rate did go up. And as we always say, development is not always linear. But mm-hmm. when, when you see this strikeout rate, you have to you have to jump on it right away. And it sounds like the Yahoo people have done that. Yeah, I I agree. I think you have to add him and put him on your bench. I will say um, I've been digging in. I, I will have my article mixing it up. Um, on uh, NBC Sports, which I do every Wednesday, which looks at pitch mix changes. I'm do- I'm doing Reed Detmers is one of the guys I'm covering. Um, I'm not as sold on all of the changes he's making to his pitch mix, so I would encourage you uh, to read that article on Wednesday. I'm still in the middle of writing it, so I'm still in the middle of researching and, and diving in. Um, but some things have jumped out to me that are maybe not as exciting as I thought. However, the performance on the field is the performance on the field. It is working right now, and he needs to be – he should be rostered and at least added to your bench to see if this is going to work out. Remember Fascinating that, start this week because he gets the Red Sox again in Fenway yeah. Park. So they've we'll seen see. him. They're going to adjust yeah. to him, and obviously the hitting environment is totally different. I don't need to tell you that. If he looks great in that start, it's like, okay, all green lights. But um, that's a, if you have a chance to watch that game on Friday, you might want to give it a uh, give it some scout. Yeah, and I think it's important to note, like even as though I write these articles about like pitch mix changes mm. through two starts, guys are still working through some stuff. So we'll we'll see what happens with Detmers. That's why I believe with his talent, he should be um, put on your bench. The second most added pitcher was Cody Bradford, who we talked about at the beginning. Um, Scott and I both, you know, co-signed him starting against the the A's this week. We don't know how long of a track record he has, but if you need a spot start, that's a good one. Um, Ronel Blanco is the third most added pitcher. Um, he, people were a little skeptical after the no hitter. He wasn't added in a lot of places. However, he did look good last night against, um, the Texas Rangers. And now he gets the Rangers again this week, which again is another one of those like, Hey, we've seen him out before. What, what are we going to do? Uh, how are we going to adjust? We've talked a lot. I put a video out on Twitter, um, about him and, you know, in a, a segment I do called who's this guy where I break down a guy who just jumps on our radar. Um, he is he has a new pitch mix. The changeup um, is leading the way now. But how long is he in the rotation? Justin Verlander is definitely coming back. Jose Urquidy is set to start throwing off a mound. He could be back in a few weeks. If Urquidy and Verlander are back, does Blanco have three more starts? Um, what are you doing with Ronel Blanco? How aggressively are you chasing this? Not at all. I mean, six walks, 11 strikeouts. His strikeout rate isn't even seven per nine. His walk rate is problematic i mean he's obviously been enormously lucky i mean any look anybody with an outlier era or batting average is lucky or unlucky depending on which way it goes that's this is no eureka moment there but when i see that walk strikeout rate in the last year he, he couldn't keep the ball in the park 12 home runs and 52 innings the rangers are going to put up six runs against him this week boom you heard it i am also skeptical so uh I would, I would, however, would add him, but I would be very tepid, and I might, I might even honestly not start him this week against Texas. But if you're in deeper formats, I could see adding him. 
Um, Spencer Turnbull was added in a lot of places because he has two starts this week. And so in weekly lineup leagues, um, he was added a lot as a two start pitcher. Turnbull is with the Phillies now. Um, and he has a spot in the rotation because of Taewon Walker's injury. Um, he was really good in his first start of the year, which came against the Reds at home in Philadelphia, which is, uh, you know, skews more hitter friendly, um, five shutout innings allowed, or sorry, one run that was unearned. So five innings, zero earned runs, three hits, seven strikeouts. Um, we've seen some pitch mix changes for Spencer Turnbull this year as well. Turnbull has also been uh, somewhat relevant in the past. Are you buying in on Spencer Turnbull? It's a fascinating to see him pitching this way where his fastball velocity has hit the low 90s now. This is a guy who used to really bring it in his early Detroit days, 3-17 three and 17 in that first full Detroit season. That was, that was rough. I lived through all of that, but... Um, you know, maybe he's figured some things out. I, I know this sounds like the biggest cop out in the world, but he's the classic guy that I would add and not have the nerve to start. If you're, and, and I know a lot of people be like, wait a minute, you know, I, I just lost pitchers. I need to put guys in my lineup. I can't do that. I understand. But, um, because he had some pedigree with the Tigers and because you know, the strikeout rate speaks for itself. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested in Turnbull. Yeah, uh, he's starting tonight against the Cardinals. Um, so it might be, uh, you know, if you're in a daily moves league and you're listening to this and you're able to pick him up and, and put him on your bench, um, that could I'm be. I'm not afraid of the card. I'm not afraid of the Cardinals. I, I'm not I'm either. Not. But if you're but if you're not convinced in Turnbull right now, he gets the Cardinals now and he gets the Pirates later. Um, that sets up as a decent two start week, even though I think we both think the Pirates are are feisty. Um, Although the pir- Turnbull- aren't the pirates always the April heroes? Maybe it just goes back Maybe. last year, but I, just, I, be- I, I, I still believe feel, you. I feel like the pirates are going to be great someday. Yes. I think at the end of the year, they're still going to be like the 79 and 83 pirates. Maybe we'll see. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little more optimistic on them. Um, Turnbull is throwing sweepers this year. That's added to his older slider. Um, and so I, that's a, a change that could make him interesting. Um, Tanner Houck is the only Red Sox pitcher, starting pitcher, not over 50% rostered. Um, he has not allowed an earned run in 12 innings. Yes, he's faced the Angels and the A's. He does get the Angels again this week. Um, Houck is throwing no more four-seam fastballs. He has just stopped throwing them. This is a guy who threw uh, 39% four-seam fastballs in 2021. He threw 24% four-seam fastballs two years ago. Uh, he's no longer throwing it. He's leaning heavily on sinker slider. The best thing potentially for him, for both Red Sox fans and fantasy purposes, the sinker is almost exclusively now arm side, so away from lefties because and jamming righties inside because he has added a cutter this year. Um, and so he's throwing a cutter inside to lefties. Lefties were a major issue for him in the past. Um, I personally think Hauk has the upside to be rostered in most formats. I think he should be started against the Angels this week because I don't think the Angels have a really good lineup. But I think that he has the potential to have a, a really strong season for the Red Sox. And so even though I'm a Red Sox fan, I would be advocating picking him up. Yeah, anybody in this rotation, I would follow Andrew Bailey into a burning building at this point. And you mentioned the key thing with Hauk for me, which is working off that platoon advantage. When you can find a way to get the other, the opposite-handed guys out, that's the key to the kingdom. That's when you become you know, a spot starter, a fifth starter, and then you take the step forward to your in the rotation the whole season. I'm excited to where this story can go. Agreed. Uh, we got two more situations. The first one I want to address is Zach Littell, um, who is still only rostered in 34% of Yahoo leagues. The uh, Rays starting pitcher converted reliever after last year came over, had success with the Rays so far this season in two starts. He's thrown 11 innings, given up just one run, in on nine hits with 11 strikeouts and two walks. Um, it almost feels like the Rays have done it again, but nobody's buying into it because Littell doesn't light up um, radar guns. He just throws, you know, 93.5 right now with, with that four seam. Um, I'm buying in. I, I don't think you need to be overly aggressive in shallow formats, but I do think like, I don't think we're in for like a Jeffrey Springs where everybody's like, oh my God, the Rays turned this guy into like a legitimate fantasy stud. But I think Zach Littell is the, a great guy to round out the end of your starting pitcher rotation and give you some solid ratios. You may be sad saying Springs because he he was like last year's Bieber where he looked too good to be true like the first mm-hmm. couple of weeks of the season. Then he was hurt and the season was over. It's like, oh, my God, he was going to the moon. So sad about that. But I'm with you on Littell. I remember one of those starts came at Coors Field. 
And so that that's an impressive feather in his cap. And he gets that Angels lineup. You know, Mike Trout sitting on three home runs, three RBIs. I wonder how four. long. Four. Because of last night, four home runs, did you get one, four did you get RBIs. A fourth one? I apologize. I did not notice Mike Trout's That's okay. RBI. Mike Trout and Tyler O'Neill both homered. And they're both ridiculous because Mike Trout has four home runs and four RBIs on the season. And Tyler O'Neill has five home runs and five RBIs on the season. Um, and it's just stupid that these two guys both are only hitting solo home runs. But well, I, uh, I thought Anthony Rendon might hit, you know, zero, zero, zero for the full sure. season. Anthony yeah, Rendon did. did get a hit. I think he walked too. And anybody who walked Anthony Rendon, I would immediately take out of the game or maybe even fine and send to the minors. But that's just me. I, I'm with you. I like the, uh, I like the Latell call and look, the Rays have been right too often for me not to consider that part. I know it sounds incredibly convenient, but Let's bet on the smart teams. The Rays are a smart team. Yep. Uh, we'll end with two closer situations. Um, it seems like Will Smith is out in Kansas City. He has not looked good. Um, and James MacArthur picked up the last two saves. However, John Schreiber is also a pitcher of note. Um, he was traded from the Red Sox to the Royals this offseason. The Royals gave up a pretty good prospect to get him. Schreiber has looked better than MacArthur early in the year. Uh, you and I talked about Jose LeClerc and how we've never been fully in on Jose LeClerc. It seems like his leash is getting much shorter. Um, Texas could turn to David Robertson or Kirby Yates. If you were in a desperate situation here in need of saves, uh, do any of those guys interest you? Yeah, well, MacArthur for sure, who I missed out on. And I have a lot of Robertson Although all my ex closers pitch for Texas, they, they've just collected so many guys. They know Leclerc, much like the Tigers knew that that Lang wasn't going to be their guy, and, and they were extremely proactive going to Foley. Uh, the Rangers, they're not. They just want a World Series for crying out loud. And look at you know all those young players they have, all the veteran talent they have, all the guys coming back in that rotation. They think they can go deep again. They're not. They're not going to suffer, Jose Leclerc. I think Jose Leclerc could be demoted from this job at any minute now. And I, I want Robertson would be my first chip. I'd be fine with Yates. I know some people might say Spores is a guy they'd look at. I think MacArthur is going to get twenty to twenty-five saves. I, I don't have any of it, and I wish I did. Yeah, I, I am actually. I kind of think Schreiber is going to get involved in there as well. I I think Kansas City is going to mix and match. They've suggested they they want to. Um, I don't necessarily think Kansas City is going to go to one guy. Mm -hmm. If you're in deeper formats or you, or you need saves, I think bids on both MacArthur and Schreiber make sense um, and see how that plays out. I also think like rostering David Robertson is not a bad idea because he has always been a solid pitcher. He will, will never he, hurt you. Never will hurt he you. get saves? We, we don't know. Um, but I but I don't think that it's I don't think it's a problem picking him up and seeing because he's probably not going to crush you. And then I will say in my AL tout league, I picked up Kirby Yates. Obviously, that is a very deep format, but why not? He looks pretty good. Josh Spores is now on the IL. So there are some late inning innings to be had for Texas. Mm -hmm. Maybe they, you know, turn back the clock with Kirby Yates. He was really good at one point in his career. So who knows? I miss the sports to the IL. So that, that makes even a stronger case for Yates being involved here. It's not going to be Leclerc. And again, again, you know, these teams, a lot of these teams are going to say, who's our best reliever. Maybe the eighth innings when the big kids come up, have the guy pitch then. Right. The thing with Robertson specifically though, is even if he doesn't close, he's going to have at least like four or five, six wins and maybe a handful of saves. That's like a low worst case scenario. And if it pops, he could get 20 plus saves. Yeah, I fully agree. Um, I love that just for that, that kind of value across all forms or, or categories. Um, Scott and I are going to be back on Wednesday. We are going to start getting uh, some hitting stats stabilizing. So Scott and I are going to look at some hot starters um, and just see which of these guys may actually be making meaningful changes to their, their batted ball quality, their plate discipline, and maybe give you some guys to, to jump on in waivers before they really kind of uh, pop on the stat sheet. Um, as always, you can find both us on Twitter. I am at Samsky NYC and Scott is at Scott underscore Pianowski. And we'll check you back later in the week for another episode of the Roto World Baseball Show.